That's great. Okay, well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started for today. So hello and welcome to our second Spotlight on Public Art at Dartmouth. I'm Sharon Reed, Programs and Events Coordinator for the Museum of Art at Dartmouth. And today we're highlighting Wide Babelki Bowl by Ursula von Reidingsvard, whom we are extremely fortunate and delighted to have with us today as our special guest. Um, just a few things, uh, please don't hesitate. If you have a question that comes up during the presentation at any time and you don't wanna forget it, don't hesitate to put it directly into the Q&A feature below and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can during the discussion at the end. And you will find some helpful tips and information in the chat box as we get started. So we're going to begin today with a very brief pre-recorded introduction to the sculpture featuring our former colleague, Jessica Hong, who is now the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Toledo Museum of Art. And I would like to point out that this video was produced by Christopher Jones, the Office of Communications here at Dartmouth. Following the video, I will turn it over to our director, John Stomberg, who will introduce our esteemed guest and we'll launch the discussion. And now we'll share the video with you. Oops. So, I'm sorry, is everybody hearing that audio? No, we're not hearing it. Katie, do you mind? We'll just, we'll, I think we'd maybe just start, stop and start again. Just, that's fine. This work is entitled Wide Babelki Bowl by artist Ursula von Reidingsvard. We were really excited to expand our collection of works by the artist and also have a work that's actually representative of the artist's practice. And she's best known for these large scale wooden sculptures in outdoor public sites. So Babelki in Polish refers to the popcorn stitches or the small wool fluff balls that get knit onto sweaters, which she remembers wearing as a child. You can see the babelki forms emerging on all sides of the sculpture. So wide babelki bowl is made entirely out of cedar, which the artist has been working in since the 1970s. And if you look closely, you can see that this is meticulously assembled. As for the specific location, the work has a lot of visual resonances with the surrounding architecture, particularly with Rollins Chapel. It's also a stone's throw away from the heart of campus. And so this sculpture becomes a part of, as well as an observer to the campus happenings. And as Wide Babelki Bowl almost looks like a geologic formation, it coalesces with the immediate landscape it's also quite distinct from it, perhaps revealing something about its environment. Okay. Well, that was wonderful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that video with us. We're gonna get the slideshow started uh, shortly um, and that will begin in a moment, but now I'd like to turn it over to John R. Stomberg, our Virginia Rice Kelsey 1961 S Director to introduce our speaker today and launch the discussion. John? Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be here today. I'm coming to you live from my office at the Hood Museum as we make preparations for reopening over the summer. Uh, I'd like to start to talk about this place because the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki people. This acknowledgement reminds us the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous people, and the museum and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. So today we're going to talk with Ursula von Reidingsvard, world renowned sculptor who has earned the respect and uh, gratitude of people around the world for sharing her work with us. It's work that joins its space with ours and becomes part of our lived experience. 
She has multiple degrees, endless honors, exhibitions all over the world, and a show which might as well have been a retrospective already under her belt. And she continues to be in the studio on a regular basis, producing fantastic artworks. And uh, please join me in welcoming Ursula von Reidingsvard to the Hood Museum of Art community. So Ursula, uh, I don't always do this, but let's start at the beginning. Um, it seems in your case, the childhood is a fitting place to begin because of the Babelkis that we were referring to. And I also know in reading and preparing for today's talk that you do bring up your background, your childhood, your growing up experiences as they continue to inform your work in so some ways. So could you talk about that? Could you talk about your, your biography and your background and how it informs your current practice? Well, I'm not sure that, that I'm going to be able to tell you how it informs my practice. But, <clears throat> but I can tell you uh, the facts that I was born in 1942 and uh, it was at the end of the war. Uh, and uh, my father got cons con constricted to um, a farm where he had, he, he was um, during, during, the rest of, uh, during the rest of the war. Uh, and when the war stopped, he was he and he was a great, great farmer. And when the when the war stopped, the Burgermeister came to my father and said, Ignatz, uh, where are you going to be going? Because uh, he saw that that's what we intended to do. And he said he, he wanted, you know, enormously to have my father stay there. But my father said that if I stay here, all my children, and by that time he, he had six children and we ended up with seven, he had six children then. And he said to the Burgermeister, he said, if I, <clears throat> if I stay here, this is what my children will have to be doing is the same thing as what as I did and you know using size to uh, cut the wheat and the rye. <clears throat> so anyway, we went to eight uh, eight uh, camps to was there they were there for Polish people. Uh, for, for, uh, uh, for until 1950, when we finally got to the place where they um, sort of, you know, so they, they make sure that, that all of the children, and by that time one more was born, when all, that all of the children were healthy enough to be going to the United States, both mentally and physically. <clears throat> which was the case. Uh, and when my, my mother and father, <clears throat> with my mother having that little one, we lined up in terms of our height to the right of them. And when we were in, in front of the, the, the entity that, that makes the decision, makes the final decision that you go into the United States, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's the point, you know, it's the reason why we went through all of these camps and, 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 uh, and, and it's really, really intense moment. Uh, so, but especially for our parents. So, so we, we made it, we went to the United States in 1950. It's, it's such an incredible origin story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, I, I know sometimes those memories are challenging, uh, but let's, so let's move right up forward and talk about Wide Babelki Bowl. Um, you build up all of your sculptures, well, most of your sculptures from cedar planks that once glued together, uh, you then carve and shape and form the outsides. And the shapes are very personal forms but then there's also the regularity of the grid that's created by the planks. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the 
free form of your carving versus the regularity of the planks and the tension that that creates? Yes, and uh, <clears throat> I work from four by four beams. And those are the things that I cut. You know, I don't glue them first because then I, I would be nowhere. I mean, it would be impossible to work that way. So they, <clears throat> I, um, there is, there is, there is a monk when I, I went to Columbia University for my master's degree, there was a monk that one day got me some cedar four by fours uh, and brought it to the place that we had or to, the, to the classroom. It, was, it really wasn't a classroom. It, it, it was a place that we worked with metals. And I got so excited. I started taking my circular saw and cutting into it. And the cutting was almost like you know, cutting into butter, you know, it was so yielded in a way that was so easy. And the, and the color was the color of flesh. And I loved digging it and I loved the feeling that I had. And somehow I then knew uh, that this will be something by my side, whether, you know, I, 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 whether I like it or not. And it ended up being that way. And, and I have had so many um, years cutting this cedar. And there was a time when nobody wore masks, you know, so that I inhaled enormous amounts of cedar dust um, that, you know, I can't take it anymore. So I wear these huge, not huge, but these, these outfits that, that, that really protect me, but they, you know, are, are above my whole head and they give me the air from my back and push the air over my head. And, and, and it's very, very pure air that I get. So, and I, and I say every time I get a truck from um, the southern corner of Canada uh, uh, of, of, of cedar, I say, Ursula, this is the last time you're going to be using it. And of course, it's been, you know, like 50 year time that I've, that I've been using it. And somehow I'm, I know I'm going to until I die. <clears throat> It has absolutely become a, a signature of your work and a, an extension of yourself. Um, it is cedar, however, and so it seems to me that once you're done carving, you've used this all your life, you know that it has a mind of its own to some degree, it's going to change its color, it's going to bend a little bit. It, so the moment you, you finish a sculpture, it still has a little bit of growing to do. So what is that like to, to, to finish the sculpture knowing that the, that last 5% is gonna be its own material guiding the process? I like it. It's, it's kind of a silvery color, uh, but, but, but it depends on where, where, the, where the piece is. Um, but, 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 but I like what nature does to it. And then of course, eventually, you know, it just can't exist. It's not like uh, the um, bronze pieces that I do that last 2000 years. Uh, but I really like what I am able to do with the cedar. And I really like um, the, 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 it feels humble and I've done things that the cedar never thought they could go through because it's like, like a complete torture for the cedar, I'm sure. Uh, but but it, 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 it's, it's, it's still the material that works for me really well. And when I do the bronze pieces, 
I do a um, a a um, that, I, that, that I do a piece that's just exactly the size that I want in cedar, totally in cedar, huge pieces that then get cast in bronze. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to underscore something you say. This isn't so much a question as a, as a, I noted when we were talking about our sculpture, you referred to her as she and that she looks good there, which, which sort of gives it a life. It gives it its own existence. And this idea that it might not be around forever sounds as though you are reconciled to this sculpture going off, living a life, and, and like, like other beings, perhaps not being infinite. Is that, is that fair uh, observation? It's fair. Yeah. It's, it's a really wonderful thought too, because the piece does feel alive. Now that I've spent over a year with it, you know, some days it feels one way and other days it looks this way. Uh, a, a morning after a rainstorm when it's just been soaked and the sun comes out and it steams a little bit. It's an entirely different feeling than on a hot <laughs> summer afternoon. You know, like it does seem to have a life. So I, I won't go too far down that, that uh, but I was glad to hear you kind of bring that, that, uh, that out. Uh, it does have a presence. So I want to talk about scale now for a moment and ask you how you think about it. Some of your sculptures loom 20 feet in the air. So as you approach, you know, it's, it's kind of awe-inspiring. And then Wide Mabelki Bowl has a more intimate scale. It's, it's just slightly larger than human height and, and it, it feels, I don't know, embraceable somehow. Could you talk about how you feel about that relationship between people standing in front of your, your work and the scale? I think that I'm, I, I have the capacity that I, that I think I have, <clears throat> that if you have a sculpture that in, embraces your entire body, that is, that's, that's much higher than the, than the person looking at the sculpture, that's much, much wider. And if you're surrounded with that sculpture, that you have more of a chance of getting a grip on the person that's lo that's looking at it and getting that person more emotionally involved while they're looking at it. Yeah. Uh, so, but that's not always true. That's not always true for sure. But I do feel <clears throat> very clearly with your work an awareness of sharing space that now I'm, now there's this other being and we are now kind of dancing. We're now having, sharing this space together and that's part of the relationship that, right. I, that I find. And then uh, I'll get one last question. We'll turn it over to questions from the audience. Um, this slide shows beautifully what I think is a wonderful relationship that the sculpture has with Rollins Chapel. Uh, <laughs> it's also in a landscape and it's got a tree behind it. So it seems to have good friends, you know, there's the, That's the, right. the rusticated That's right. stone. Could you talk about locating your work, what you think of and what you think of, of art? Well, you don't have to tell us about our installation, but like what you think about when you're talking about locating your work. In, in it's the extremely important to locate the piece in the in, in, in properly, but properly means many things, but <clears throat> but 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 yes, you you thought I I I knew immediately that you thought about re really carefully before you located it uh, by seeing all of the uh, sides that 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 it faces and and all of the sides that one can see. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of the job that you did uh, with citing this piece. Um, and usually, uh, almost always, uh, when especially when I do the, the the bronze pieces, I am I am there when we install the piece, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's uh, you know it's 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 the moment that you give that piece a chance to sing, you know, to be like a princess to 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 you know if it's done if it's done right you're giving that that artwork all of the 
plus chances you can give it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. That's that's really the way it felt. I can tell you that a group of us from the museum spent several days wandering around campus looking for just the right place, and then then it became all about the details of getting permission. But mm -hmm. uh, and I have to say, it, it is truly wonderful to have this sculpture on campus. Uh, thank you again for helping us get it here. Uh, so I'd like to turn over to questions. And the first one is about surface. Uh, the, the questioner is, notes that sometimes you use graphite on the surface, but there must also be some kind of varnish or something. Could you talk about how you get those special surfaces? Yes, graphite I use. Uh, and um, it doesn't stay forever when the piece is outdoors. Uh, but it actually stays basically forever if you put it inside. What I do is I take a brush and put it into the powder. The powder is the same thing that the graphite that's in the pencil ground up into a fine powder. Uh, so I, 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 I put my brushes in the, in the bucket and really try to grind in you know, on top of the um, spray, uh, the, the, the glue that I spray on the surface. Uh, and, and I, I, I put, I put the uh, graphite on top of that, and then it gets scraped with a scouring pad. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that bring the scraping brings all of the uh, profiles you know all of the 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 my my really complicated uh uh surfaces you know it it, it just sort of delineates them mm. so it, it's not really about um saving the wood in that way like the, the graphite is an aesthetic it's not like a, using a varnish or something that's going to prepare the wood um so um, another question that we had, where did it go? We had a question a moment ago. Um, sorry, I'm not that technically savvy. Uh, the question, if I remember correctly, was um, can you always get the, the cedar that you need? Are there sustainability issues? Do you worry about running out? Um, or are there environmental concerns that you have about using this word or wood? No, I don't. I, 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 I don't have concerns. Given, you know, what we do with cardboard, what we do to the, to the, 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 the cardboard is made, made from wood, from the trees. Uh, and, and that, you know, what I do, I, I think, I feel, I mean, I feel good about mm. uh, what I do with it. And it is also, they, they're planted to be cut. Right, so it is a sustainable, it is absolutely a sustainable yeah. material. Um, the, the same uh, questioner wondered if she could see, I think it was a she, if they could see uh, some of the bronzes. We don't, we can't like switch now to show you some bronzes, but I invite everybody to Google Ursula's work. And if you put in bronze, you will certainly see great pictures. And um, can you see the big, uh, the big, uh, uh, Sharon, is that possible for us to see, uh, the, the slide yes, of the bronze? Yes, we can absolutely. Um, okay. but, but we need to see the large Bombelki bowl before we leave the bowl. Okay, so, yeah. so that's the inside of it, and that's the outside of it. And then can we see the bigger one? Oh. Yes. Okay. These are just some installation shots. Yes, yes. So there were 18 separate pieces, and that's Sean Weeks Earp. He's the one that installed it. And yes, he is an, uh, a, a, a related to Wyatt Earp. Huh. He's very, very good. There. Yes, there it is. There's. That, so that, that, the one that you have made this one happen, you know, I, I, I just thought there was this exhibition that I was having in, 
in 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 Europe, and I thought, oh my God, this would this would this would do it. It was in a nunnery, old nunnery. Uh, so the next one. It also gives us a chance to see the surface when they're fresh, freshly cut. That's right. That's before right. Before they've aged. And and this you can see the inside of it, and you can see the scale in 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 relationship to a human being. And 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 I'm grateful to yours that helped me figure this out. These are these are magnificent slides, and there you can see the regularity versus the irregularity. Yes, the, the, the grid versus your carving, uh, which That's becomes exactly so expressive right. together. It's a good one to see. Yeah. And then Sharon, I think we've got about two minutes left which should be enough time for us to look at some of the bronze ones. And there's an example of your graphite and the cedar. Yes. It's called ocean floor and that's called droga in Polish. It means my, my loved one. Mm. And uh, Charas Bombelkami, that's, that's the piece with uh, uh with that 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 you saw in the film that was made from uh the little little balls that i had on the, on my sweater as a little girl and that's that's on the left it's 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 the piece uh charas bagaki with at sf moma now was that sf moma piece a bronze and uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, unraveling is that's the piece. And this is for Stash. Stash is my favorite brother brother. And it's huge. <laughs> mm. It doesn't get it doesn't get into many exhibitions because it's so huge. Okay, this one is Eleganca. It's at at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and she's so happy there. It's uh, resin, and this is also at the at the, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and it's uh, called Br uh, Bronze Bowl with Lace. So this is bronze and, and that does give I love, love what it does at the top in terms of, you know, turning to the sky and, and just letting itself go. Sharon, I think we should hold on this slide as we get ready to wrap up. Uh, it's such a beautiful uh, point to, to wrap up on because it is both weighty and effervescent, you know, it, the way it tapers off into that lit, uh, that lacy top, uh, I mean, this sculpture must weigh a ton and yet it, it looks absolutely effortless and light and floating. It weighs three tons. Three tons, my goodness. So that's what happens when you start casting in bronze too. I mean, it, it gets some serious weight. But you see, Just, it had a model in cedar first. Yeah. It was all made in cedar first. Wow. The huge amount of labor and uh, the results I love. And how long did it take? And this, I promise, this will be my last question. Uh, how long did it take you to become accustomed to the surface of bronze versus wood? I mean, this has the fur, the, 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 the surface of, of, of wood. It copies it, it, it very, very, my, exactly because I made the whole thing first in cedar. I have to say, anybody who's ever seen your bronzes, knows that you have to get really close to see whether it's bronze or wood because up until about a foot away it looks just like uh, your cedar works so well on that note uh ursula it has been really really wonderful to have you speak to our audience it's great to see you again uh the hood community thanks you for sharing your work and your thoughts and your passion with us and you have an open invitation any time now that the world is opening up again, we hope you find your way to central New Hampshire 
and we can walk around and have a good long look at that sculpture together. I would love that. I would love that. And I will be doing that. And thank you so much, John. You know, you were you such a such a gem, you know, with the way that you handled this whole thing. Thank you. Well, thank it was a, it's a terrific partnership with a super, super happy, not ending, uh, I guess beginning. It has a very happy beginning because this is just the start and now we all get to live with your work. So yeah. thank you very much. Uh, Sharon, do you want to sign off or say anything before we go? Sure, I just wanted to, to thank you again, Ursula, also and echo what John said for your generosity and your time and sharing with us today. And thank you to everyone who helped us out today. Um, and encourage you for everybody joining us today that, you know, as it's safe for you to experience the wide Belbelki Bowl in person, please do so on campus. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful work and we hope you get a chance to view it from all angles at your leisure. Um, this program has been reported. It will be available on YouTube in the coming days. Um, and we hope you'll join us again in the future for our next spotlight on public art. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you. Okay. Thank you. Have a great too. afternoon. You too. Bye.